From the keyboard to the boardroom, this is the business of esports. The Business of Esports podcast is sponsored by Esports Entertainment Group, a leading esports and online gambling company. For more information, go check them out at esportsentertainmentgroup.com. From the keyboard to the boardroom, this is the Business of Esports podcast. I am Paul Dewalibi. I'm joined today by my friend and co-host, Jimmy Barada. For those of you who are new to the podcast, welcome to the official podcast of esports. What we do here is we cover the most pressing gaming and esports topics and news of the week. But we look at all of it through a business and C-suite lens. We dissect, we analyze the business implications of everything happening in this industry. For our regular listeners, thank you guys for tuning in every week. Thank you for all the love, the five-star ratings and reviews. We really appreciate it. If you haven't yet, tell your friends, tell your colleagues, tell your coworkers about the podcast. Um, it's how this has continued to grow. We really appreciate it. And leave that five-star rating and review. It's... Um, you know, the algorithm in the back at Apple um, or Spotify or wherever you listen to our podcast uh, favors the podcast with good reviews. So if you enjoy it, we really appreciate you leaving that. Jimmy, how's it going? How you doing? I know you're not at home. No, I, I, early apologies to our listeners. I'm on the road in Chicago right now. I was at the Esports Trade Association's conference and seminar where they had me on as a panelist. Got to meet Jeff the Juice Cohen. If you're a fan <laughs> of our live after show, please <laughs> drop in and let Jeff know. Uh, got to meet him in person for the first time, which is great because uh, Jeff and I get along, I think, on the live show. We both have bulldogs. It was nice to, to see him and to shake his hand, give him a hug. You know, I there was remarkably little like broing over bulldogs, I feel. <laughs> but I also wasn't there with you guys the first day you met. So did I miss it? Did I miss all the... We, we keep that for the private bulldog channel okay. in the discord, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but, but I will say, you know, we met so many great people at the event. So many of you uh, that listen came up to let me know that you listened to the show, that you, that you were a fan, that you had an interesting business or a concept that you wanted to talk about. Um, thank you for not being shy. Thank you for approaching, for, for, for sharing that you're a fan. That's why we do this. And for anyone listening here that I either didn't meet in Chicago or that didn't make it to Chicago, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. You know, this, we, we, we love putting on this show. We love learning about your businesses, what's going on. And hopefully we're really approachable or, or likable <laughs> and not too scary. So we'd love to, to speak with as many of you as I can. So Jimmy, I, I apologize. I'm already back home. So I missed your panel and I missed Jeff's panel, which I feel very badly <laughs> about. <laughs> um, no, no. How did they go? I guess I'm curious. You know, I, my panel was uh, was with YouGov, our sponsor for our live after show. Ben Perro did an awesome job putting together some great slides that we were able to talk about. If you're a fan of the live after show, uh, it was very similar to what we do there, where we talk about different insights and apply them to to our industry or, or, or to you know real world scenarios. Uh, unfortunately, I also missed Jeff's because after I got <laughs> off uh, stage, uh, I just started meeting a lot of people that you know that wanted to to share their, their insight or just to introduce themselves. And so I didn't get to, I got in at the last second to get Jeff a quick photo on stage for his wife, but I missed everything else. <laughs> so I also, I just want to say one before we have an amazing, amazing guest today and I want to get to him. Uh, but I do want to say, so personally, I was only there one day. Uh, I had fun because they invited me to come judge a pitch competition, which is sort of my natural habitat, right? Like to, I've done this, been doing this for 20 years uh, as a VC. And, um, you know, I, I, I made sure that I wasn't being uh, too negative. I think I, I think I accomplished that. I think I was pretty fair with everyone who got on stage. But the highlight of the whole show for me was just, and Jimmy, you, you sort of scooped me on this, was all the people who came up to say they listened to the podcast. Like e even Jeff and poor Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> realized more people listen to the podcast than the live stream. That's just the reality. It's, you know, the podcast is a hundred episodes older than the live stream. Uh, you know, we have a, almost 150 podcast episodes and only 50 live stream, but 
uh, he was upset that a lot of people came to say hi to the prophet and not as many came to say hi to the juice. Uh, and so now, now it's our goal. <laughs> he, he's going to listen to this and I'm, he's going to hear me say, now it's our goal. We got to get everyone who <laughs> listens to come say hi to the juice. Next time you see him at an event or an esports conference, uh, make sure you recognize him as the juice and tell him how much you love his, his commentary, even though I'm always right. And he's almost off and always wrong. Um, that's okay. Yeah, we still we still love the juice. But um, I will say there is one person who came up, uh, a fan of the show, really great guy. I won't name names, but but called the prophet a god, and and I would say that sets a high bar for everyone everyone else. <laughs> I wish this wasn't true, but like I was there. <laughs> it's, it's not good for. It's not, it's not good for you, Paul. Not good for anybody. <laughs> Uh, no, I, in all, in all, uh, modesty and honesty, uh, I've just, I was humbled, flattered, uh, that so many of you guys love the show and this is why we keep doing it. It's why we love doing it. And, and so huge thanks to, uh, the folks at esports trade association, but even bigger thanks to everyone who attended and came up, uh, and talked to us and, and appreciated the podcast. So really thanks to you guys. All of our success is because of you. So thank you. Um, Jimmy, we have an amazing guest today. Um, we have, and I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm going to do my best with his name. I promised, uh, we have none other than Deshaun Petrovich, uh, on the, the, on the eye. I got it. I think, uh, CEO of Antares gaming, Deshaun, welcome to the business of esports podcast. Hey, thanks a lot, guys. Paul, you did you did okay. You know, like you, like eighty percent, right? The, on the on the name there. Okay, I'll take it. I'll take yeah. it, <laughs> uh, Deshaun. <laughs> for our listeners who maybe don't know about you or Antares Gaming, uh, would love if you could give them a bit of your background, how you got into gaming, you know, what you're focused on now, things you're excited about. Would love just some of the Deshaun and Antares story. Excellent. I uh, really appreciate the time, guys. I, I appreciate the invite. Uh, this is this is going to be fun. Um, I would say that my background is is perhaps a bit different from what you've been accustomed to on the show. I'm I'm not naturally a gamer. I, I really come at the gaming space as an outsider. Uh, I, I look at everything from a business lens. So my my whole background has been initially in engineering, and then I did a bunch of work in uh, capital markets, investing, venture capital. Uh, and so I, I really started paying attention to gaming probably close to 10 years ago now. And it really came from the business lens standpoint. You know, this is, there's something phenomenal happening in gaming. There's tremendous growth and viewership and popularity. What's happening here? Um, I need to start really ramping up on what's happening in gaming so that I know how to make investments, where to make investments. So it was really from that VC cap that I started looking at the business. Being an outsider, it has its drawbacks, but sometimes it has its advantages as well. I tend to ask stupid questions sometimes, uh, but sometimes those stupid questions can lead to some interesting insights, right? As far as do, do things really need to be done this way? Um, so, you know, my my whole perspective on gaming was, you know, I have a I have a, a chart that I use in in some of my pitch decks that really shows how gaming over the past 20 years has exploded in popularity relative to music and, and movie, the movie industries. Uh, about 20 years ago, they were all generally at, at the same level as far as you know global revenues are concerned. And then all of a sudden gaming just took off, right? And now gaming is about three and a half to four times the size of the music and movie industries combined. And for me, the real story that underlines that that phenomenon is, is the idea of gaming as a communications platform, right? If you think about music and movies, really it is a broadcast media, right? It is uh, a bunch of professionals get together, they put some good content out there, uh, and hopefully millions of people come and watch, right? It's a passive form of entertainment. Um, that's what gaming used to be, right? Back when we were in our basements playing our video games, right? We didn't have the internet, we didn't have all these... Uh, the, the connections to people, but that's that was the big change, right? So that's the part that I really wanted to um, really probe into and make sure that here's what's really interesting here, right? It is that social media 2.0, right? The evolution of Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, really it's gaming, right? That that was that was the underlying thesis that I had when I first started really delving deeper into this industry, um, and then. 
how that evolved, you know, I was, uh, it was about four or five years ago where really the esports movement was really starting to take off, right? So I was looking at a um, lot of potential esports e companies that were coming, looking for money, looking for investment. And the funny thing was, I didn't really like any of them. And it was, it wasn't a personal thing. It was more, I'm not getting the business fundamentals here, right? I'm not really, uh, I, I think it's only the tip of the iceberg that the, that the current esports industry is addressing, right? Esports is great. It's a billion dollar market. Nothing wrong with that. But gaming is a $150 billion market, right? So I like to differentiate between esports and gaming. And, and that was the part that was missing for me, right? It was... It was, you know, I was asking the question, why is it that esports is looking to mimic the traditional sports model, right? Why do we need to have city-based franchises um, coming in and, um, you know, paying publishers big fees to enter into these leagues and trying to have the Super Bowl of Overwatch or League of Legends or whatever it is? Why, why does it have to be that way, right? It just didn't, it didn't make sense to me. It wasn't leveraging the real potential of gaming as a communications platform. So I really... You know, I didn't make any investments in those companies. Some, you know, some were right decisions, some were wrong decisions. But the bottom line was um, they weren't doing it the way I wanted to do it, right? And that was really the genesis of Antares Gaming, right? This is a company that um, I and, and, and founders, uh, some co-founders of mine, we seeded it through our, our venture capital company. And the whole goal was to really create, um, you know, the first gaming company that was focused on gaming and not esports right it was focused on bringing in thousands tens of thousands hundreds of thousands of people to become involved to join the team not just watch the team right our vision our tagline is is unifying the world worlds of gaming and pop culture right so you know one of the things that we're focused on really is looking at gaming and saying that you know if we're right if um the social media is is evolving towards uh, gaming, which we think we're, you know, that, that's not a bad assumption to make right now, given that the Gen Z's, I mean, their number one form of, of, of communication and content right now is gaming. So if we're right on that, then every brand, every celebrity out there who's got a Twitter account or an Instagram account, we think they're going to need a gaming account, a gaming profile. And, and what does that look like? And how can we facilitate that? And that's really the the genesis of what we're trying to do with Antares Gaming. So we launched last year. Uh, we we announced some some really cool partnership uh, partnerships with some NFL uh, players, both uh, uh, former and current NFL greats. Most recently, we launched uh, an initiative with uh, the Deepak Chopra Foundation, uh, global meditation, uh, mental health. Um, you know. Uh, uh, you know, equality, climate change guru. Um, so, you know, we're really excited about that. Lots of good news to come. Uh, and the last big thing was we we made a, a recent uh, a merger with another company in the space called Kangarna Gaming. We're really excited about that. It's a great group of guys who really know what they're doing in the worlds of gaming, right? So Current uh, Apex Legends champions, right? You guys won the last... Uh, yeah, the ALGS, that's right. The ALGS, right? Yeah. Was, that uh, is correct. That big is correct. time underdogs too. Yeah, we made we made some noise there. Big we big noise. noise that was impressive. Yeah. yeah, so that's so it's been a busy few months, and you know we're looking forward to uh, you know espousing the vision, which which again seems to be a little bit different from what many others are saying in the worlds of esports. So I should probably pause there a little bit and give you guys a chance <laughs> to talk as well. But uh, hopefully that helps <laughs> provide a little bit of context. Deshaun, I, you know I love the way you came at this because I see so many similarities with the way. At least in the beginning, I felt like a little bit of an outsider to the industry. I mean, I've been a hardcore gamer my entire life. Uh, so, like, the gaming piece was was known to me. But I, do you agree? Like, I'm curious how, over the last 10 years, from an evolution perspective for the industry, have you seen more outsiders coming in? Do you think the industry still could use more outside influence? Um, you know, as a... As a VC early on, one of the one of the core parts of my thesis was there weren't a lot of great founders who had a ton of experience building real businesses, right? A lot of people passionate about gaming, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. not a ton of like real company builders. And I'm curious if you felt that 10 years ago, do you still feel that way today or or are we further along? 
No, we're fortunately, I think we are further along because I, I agree with you. There were there were um, absolutely lots of lots of people who were very just great gamers and even great personalities online. They they know how to build a following. They're they're really good at being streamers and influencers and gamers and content creators. But that that gap of actually how do we what's a what's a sustainable business model that we can create? That's the gap that was missing. So um, I think fortunately the you know, I, I think we're well past the point of kind of your your gray hairs asking the question, well, is this gaming thing for real? Is it a fad? Yeah. Like, I think we're well past that point, fortunately. Um, so as a result of that, I think you do have a lot more um, just legitimate parties, legitimate people who are coming into the industry and bringing in some of those outsider perspectives, right? You know, I used to run this tech, tech company. I used to run this this uh, you know consumer goods company, and now I can bring some of those those skill sets, some of those learnings I can bring into the gaming space, and I think it's it's benefiting the industry quite quite nicely over the past few years. I'm curious how you position Antares, Deshaun. Like we spend a lot of time talking about esports teams on the podcast, obviously. And in some ways, they're the flashiest businesses in the industry, right? They raise a lot of money. They get a lot of the press and the headlines. How do you, like, when you look at a Cloud9 or a 100 Thieves or, a, a, you know, FaZe Clan or how do you, like, if someone asks you, what what is the key difference between what you're doing and what they're trying to do? I'm curious, how do you sort of explain that or how, how do you how do you put that in sort of a concise way? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, great question. Or position yourself against yeah, them, I should say. For sure. I mean, so one of the things that, you know, we've seen when we talk to um, celebrities and brands, um, quite often they they do talk about the idea that they have, they've had various forms of partnerships or engagements with some of the bigger esports companies out there. And that is, that's a very um, classic business model, right? You know, here's a brand, it's got a following, it's got viewership. So in in essence, you're 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 tying yourself to that brand, right? You you are you are um, you know whatever they have, if it fits with if it aligns with your vision and, and values and all the rest of it, you're okay to align with that brand, and you can be the beneficiary or not of whatever they decide to do. The, the thing that we're doing that's very different is that one, we're really creating you know, these teams, we, we, I ha even hesitate to call them teams. We like to call them clubs or squads, because one of the things that we're doing is we like to build, we're looking to really um, amplify the, the brands or the celebrities existing brand vision and values, right? So if you think about when a celebrity or a brand goes out there and they have their, they launched their Twitter page and their Instagram and their Facebook and everything else, they have, they are embedding all of their, their, core values into that, their branding, their messaging. And so what we're able to do is we can build a team that's that's highly personalized and highly customized to that brand's vision and values, right? So long as it it matches up with what we're interested in, right? There's a there's a very important social component to what we do as well. Um, you know, uh, we have we make sure that 10% uh, of all of our revenues go to a social cause of, of the, the celebrities choosing, of the brands choosing. Um, so that is something that we're passionate about. And so when we go out there and craft a team for a celebrity, we can ensure that this really is, um, this is something that the celebrity, it's an extension of their brand. It's something that they have control over that really aligns with their interests. And we can, we can ensure that we have fair representation on the squad. When we go out there and we invite and recruit people to come and join and be part of the experience, um, we can avoid some of the pitfalls of gaming, right? It's still too much a young white male game, right? And it doesn't need to be, right? Gaming is much broader than that. Esports isn't. That's one of the problems that we're looking to address. So we can have five, 10, 15,000 people. Um, we can invite them. We can recruit them. We can mobilize them. We can have them involved in a celebrity uh, or a brand's squad and team. And we can ensure that we we are covering all the bases, that we have all genders, races, ethnicities, sexual orientation, uh, socioeconomic status, right? We, we ensure fair representation 
um, because it's the right thing to do and because it makes business sense, right? And then we leverage off of the idea that all of these people are not just passive watchers, they're active participants, right? They're involved in creating content. They're involved in amplifying what the celebrity is doing, putting their own spin on things. So really it is, is what we're looking to take advantage of what gaming is, which is at its best an interactive experience, not a passive come watch me experience. Kind of, I'm kind of at a loss here, Dushan, because you just took two questions out of my mouth, which was, you know, what do you look for when you're aligning yourself with these traditional entertainment properties and brands? And then also, how do you mobilize them so that they're actually full participants engaged in the partnership, et cetera? And I thought that was really well stated. Um, I'm, I'm curious if we can actually have any specific examples or if you'd rather not, that's fine. But you guys have some amazing partnerships with Deepak Chopra, Marshawn Lynch and Chad Ochocinco from the NFL. You, yeah. you, you spoke briefly towards the recent partnership with Kangarna. Um, is there anything in particular with one of those that you can kind of take us from, you know, when you first approached or looked for adding a traditional entertainment property in in sports, for example? I mean, you, you know, you're barely scratching the surface. There's so much talent out there, mm -hmm. and it, but it really takes that partner that wants to work, that wants to be a part of this, as you mentioned. Can you take us from the start to finish on, on the, I suppose, the difficulties of Antares in finding the right partners and vetting them and obviously achieving the success that you guys have, have found? Yeah, yeah, no, that's, that's, um, that's very good. Um, so one of, the, one of the important things that we... So again, fortunately, we're past the point of trying to convince celebrities and brands that gaming is something that they should be at least participating in in some way, right? Um, many of the celebrities we talk to, they're already gamers, which is a good thing. Younger audience, they like to game, um, you know, quite often stuck in hotel rooms, nothing else to do, do some gaming, right? Um, so we don't need to spend too much time convincing them of that. But the part that's that's really different from what we do is celebrities... It's not as simple, you know, it's not as simple as just going out there. Like if a celebrity launches a Twitter page or an Instagram account, generally they're going to get a bunch of people to come, right? It's it's kind of a passive, you know, yeah, sure, I'll follow them, right? Just So that's why it ends up that you have a million people, two million, three million people come to an Instagram page for a celebrity, even if the content that they're putting out there is infrequent or lackluster or whatever it is, right? Gaming is not like that, right? Many many um, many celebrities out there have actually, you know, they've tried to go on Twitch and stream and everything else. And you know what? Fifty people show up, right? Twenty five people show up. It just, it's not, it's not sufficient, right? That the, the having the name is not sufficient to attract uh, a real audience in gaming, right? So the way we we approach that issue is is by having this squad around you. The idea is we can leverage you as a celebrity, we can leverage your time much more wisely so that so that it isn't just your time that's the limiting factor, right? The idea is you as a celebrity are 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 busy, right? You have day jobs, you have a bunch of competing interests, all kinds of things that you're working on. So how can you um, be involved in the world of gaming and yet you you clearly don't have you can't spend 100 hours a, a week that some of the the pro gamers and pro streamers are doing online right you you don't have that luxury so how can we take into take that into account take in your time constraints and make sure that we're getting amazing bang for the buck for the few hours a month that you're able to to devote to this this activity right to this pursuit and that's how we do this around the squad right so we actually employ some really cool technology where we have this incentive-based system with rewards, um, where in effect, a celebrity, um, you know, we're gonna have, we have this squad of thousands of people that come and they are incentivized to go out there and, and participate in events, to, um, you know, be involved in the, in the, in the causes and in, in what the celebrity is involved in. And they earn these, these virtual tokens, virtual points, um, which then they can redeem in exchange for some really important experiential type rewards, like a chance to play with your favorite celebrity, right? So in essence, what we're doing is we're giving lots of value to the celebrity because it's not the, the three hours of time that they're able to spend per month is insufficient to create a business. But if you have 2000 people that are involved in in creating content that is really that aligns and is consistent with the messaging of that celebrity, that's a highly monetizable asset. And it's an asset that has a lot of weight 
uh, for the celebrity to go out there and just uh, increase and improve their brand, right? So that's how, that's the, that's the value add. That's the ROI that we deliver to the celebrity. For the gamers and influencers, what we're saying is, hey, you're looking for ways to differentiate, right? You, you are creating some good content. You have 50, 100, 150 followers out there that are paying attention to what you do, but how do you stand out? Here's a bigger stage for you to go out there and put forth your content, have it be amplified by the community, by the squad, by the celebrity, so that you can grow and become a bigger name in the industry while you're doing something authentic because you're following somebody that you're a fan of. Right. I mean, if I had the opportunity to really be involved in, you know, I got a poster here behind me of the Toronto Raptors and Kawhi shot. I mean, if I could, I mean, nobody could play with Kawhi. He's a bit of a he's a bit of an oddball. But if I could play with Kyle Lowry or if I could play with Fred Van Vliet, um, man, that would be that would be something that I'd be really encouraged and incentivized to 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 offer my best engagement and to be involved. Right. And that's what we're offering to these uh, to, the, to the squad members. And you mentioned an underlying software with the token system that supports this interactivity. Uh, where can our listeners go to uh, online to to take part if they were so interested? Yeah, so so right now um, we have uh, probably our website is the best place to go because our website will take you to uh, all of the teams that we launched on the NFL side uh, and also to the the Deepak Chopra page, which is which happened just called Never Alone Gaming is is the name of the the Chopra Foundation's gaming team. Uh, so our website, which is entharysgaming.com, is probably the best starting point. Uh, or you could just, you know, Google Never Alone Gaming, and that'll take you there as well. Deshaun, how do you how do you um, how do you win celebrities over, especially like the biggest names? When I assume, like, essentially, your competition is hundred thieves, you know, writing them a big check up front. Like, mm -hmm. what is the pitch to the celebrity? Because you're not like my understanding here is you're not creating an esports team for that celebrity. You're really creating a community, a gaming community around that celebrity, right? Um, yeah. I mean, we, it's a, it's a, it can be a team, a squad, a club. It really is their own dedicated team, right? That's the big differentiator, right? It's, it's hundred thieves or face clan. Yeah. I mean, yeah, they'll, they'll give you a check and you can be involved and your face will be on the website, but it's not your team, right? Mm -hmm. This is actually, if you, if you want to, create your own asset, right? If you want to be in charge of, of your own gaming presence and, and, you know, we have this whole playbook that goes into, well, what are the things that you really care about even outside of your sport or outside of your, your art, movie star, musician, whatever it is, you know, what are the hobbies? What are your hobbies? What do you like to be involved in? What are the games you like to play? Like this whole team is catered around the idea that this is your own personalized gaming squad, right? This is your, you're the owner of your team and we're the GM and we're helping manage and we're putting all this together. We're mobilizing, we're, we're creating programming and events, but really you're the team in effect, the owner. And that has a lot of appeal for certain people, other people, they wouldn't mind getting the check from, from hundred thieves. Right. I guess I'm curious and I don't know how much you can talk to the business model or the economics, but like, are like, are the economics for the influencer, the athlete, the musician, you know, the star, are they compelling long-term? Like, do they have some long-term ownership in this team? Uh, again, I don't know how much you can talk to or feel comfortable talking to, but I'm curious what the economics look like for that influencer. I mean, f for the time being, um, you know, we're, we're, we're open to evolution, like every young company, right? We need to be nimble and flexible with respect to how we go out there and what we're doing. Um, you know, our, our take on the market was creating that alignment, right? The alignment, um, out of one out of necessity, because, you know, we didn't, we, we didn't launch with 50 million bucks in the bank that we can toss around in cash and see what sticks, right? So really it, the alignment, uh, what I'll say is the alignment is definitely there for everyone to succeed, um, but it does require everyone's buy-in, right? So it's, it, um, you know, there are certain celebrities that, that kind of are of the view that, hey, you can, you can use my likeness. Uh, you can, you can put my face on a shampoo bottle and send the checks my way, right? That's mm -hmm. not what we're looking for. That's not, that's not really the business model that we're interested in, uh, in the world of gaming. What we're interested in are the celebrities, are the people out there who want to have another connection with their fans, who want to have another form 
another communication platform. They're doing their Instagram and Twitter thing, but so here's another mechanism for them to engage with the broader audience, with the younger audience, to do something that they enjoy doing anyways, which these celebrities, many of them do like to gain. So that's the ideal candidate for us. And, um, and again, I, I would say that we're in a situation where, you know, um, nobody makes money until everybody makes money, right? So the Got alignment it. is there. So that, uh, there's almost like ownership type of alignment, yeah. right? In that sense. Yeah. Um, is the goal to capture like 50 huge celebrities? Because you've got obviously huge names already. Is the goal to sort of get 50 or 100 massive names, like really big influencer names, and then sort of like not call it quits, but like you're good at that point? Or is the goal to become a platform where like, the prophet can have his own, you know, gaming squad and community. I, you know, I do have millions and millions of fans, but I'm, you know, maybe not Deepak Chopra. Um, and so, you know, is the, is the goal to capture the long tail or is it just to get like the 50 or 100 biggest names you can? I mean, I, I would say the the reality is, is that the what we've found is that it, it makes sense for us to to really align ourselves with people who buy the premise of what we're talking about, right? So we're going to be able to create a lot more value for ourselves and our company and the celebrity um, to the extent that they have bought into what we're talking about. Because what we're saying isn't really what everybody else is saying, right? Um, so it does take a little bit of a, 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 little bit of a, a, a philosophical alignment to say that here's, here's the difference, right? And, but what did it, entails what it requires is some level of active participation, you know, full acknowledging, fully acknowledging that, as we said, celebrities are busy and you, this isn't a full time job for you, right? It is for us, right? So we'll, we'll make sure that everything runs smoothly, but we do need three hours of your time every month to make sure that this is something that, that is a real authentic experience for all your fans and all the brands and everyone who we're bringing to the table. So the goal, that's where the goal is, right? So if it's a situation where, um, you know, we have an opportunity to sign somebody who's a mega super celebrity, but they're not really going to be involved. It's going to be somebody who's more uh, an agent or a representative or a manager or something to that effect. It probably, you know, it would be cool, I guess, yep. but uh, it's not really going to move the needle um, from the standpoint of actually doing something that's, that's generating real momentum. So, you know, Paul, I mean, certainly we'll, we'll have this discussion uh, <laughs> offline as far as, uh, you know, let, it might be fun, right? Go through the process, build your own squad and uh, see, see what happens. I, you know, I'm, I, I'm, I'm tempted. I think it's, I think it, you know, there's something interesting there, right? Where even if, even uh, if, 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 if it's a platform where influencers, it, and, and I think the Deepak Chopra sort of news and, and that partnership was most exciting for me because it sort of proves that you can build gaming communities around influencers of, of all kind, right? Like it doesn't have to be mm -hmm. just a football player or it doesn't have to be just a basketball player. Like there's, there's real universal appeal to gaming and, and to be able to build a platform that allows that I think is kind of cool, right? Like that. And, and so I was half joking about about a profit kind of squad, but I don't think you were joking at all. No, no I wasn't joking. <laughs> no, I mean, don't forget. I mean, because again, you wouldn't know this if you're looking at esports, but there's three billion people globally in gaming, right? It's old people, it's young people, it's women, men. I mean, it's lots and lots of people are out there gaming, and it, and it's 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 generally ninety nine percent of the time it's for fun and engagement, and it it, it isn't necessarily the best. Call of Duty player in the world, right? I mean, um, that's the part that often gets neglected. It, it so, includes mobile, right, Paul? <laughs> well, <laughs> well we, yeah. we, we can talk about that one. Yeah. Um, I, I'm, I'm curious how you um, put that sort of thesis, that vision, which I, I, I think is an exciting one, sort of next to a Kangarna, which, you know, I'm personally a fan of because I was a huge Apex player. Um, right. And... But the, is falls in my mind in more traditional esports org, right? Like recruit the very best players, get some sponsors, make some hoodies, and like you're off to the races, right? It, it, how do you put those two side by side, Deshaun, and say like what is what is the thesis around putting those two pieces together? 
so so Kangarna is a, is a cool organization because they they're not really in my mind traditional esports org, right? They've always been highly focused on 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 creating compelling content and entertainment and making their squad open to um, a much more diverse base of people to come and get involved, right? And so it wasn't, they weren't really competing um, to try and go out there and recruit top 10, you know, Call of Duty or Fortnite players, right? What they were looking to do was really focus in on how do we create some really compelling content? And if a mechanism to do that is to have some 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 pretty good players come up and, and stream, then so be it. But really, it's people who have, you know, more of a more of a, a following and, and influence online than it is about their actual technical skill level in a particular game. Hmm. The, the, the one thing that I've always found interesting is there's a very low correlation between actual viewership and engagement and talent and actual like hardcore talent. If you look at some of the big biggest streamers out there. I mean, maybe there was a time when they were the best gamers at their particular game. It's not the case, not, <laughs> not the case anymore, right? Yeah. I mean, so, so that's something that they haven't. You know, I I would say they'll probably be mad at me for saying this, but I think we, you know, we kind of got lucky with this ALGS thing. I mean, it's not <laughs> like we had spent millions of dollars to to try and secure a an ALGS victory, right? Sometimes yep. it happens, sometimes it doesn't. But really, why we put these two groups together is because. You know, I mentioned that we, our emphasis is on, is on gaming uh, celebrity uh, business sense. What they're really good at is is that gaming infrastructure, right? It's it's how do how do we create compelling content? How do we attract uh, uh, really good streamers and influencers to come in come and be involved? How do we attract sponsors? How do we create cool events and programming? And those these guys are just rock stars in that. Right. So now we're really able to fuse the two worlds together when we say, hey, uh, you know, hey, Deepak or hey, you know, whoever's coming. Uh, we're going to be announcing some pretty cool things there in, in, in about a week. But whatever celebrity is comes to be involved. Now we're saying, hey, you know what else is on our team? We're hosting events right now that are generating 100,000 CCV concurrent viewers, 4 million impressions. We have the infrastructure in place to really pop you in and leverage the gaming street cred that we have with Kangarna. And now we fuse the two worlds together, right? It's interesting that, that it, it is gaming street cred for sure, but it, it, I, I thought you were gonna go with a different answer because I thought so much of at least the Kangarna, like what appealed to me about the whole ALGS thing was there was great storytelling around it. And some of it was not on purpose, obviously, like one of their players I think was like basically homeless, right? Oh, yeah. Like had been yeah. kicked out of his home yeah. and like, winning this thing like was life changing. Right. So there was this, there was this incredible like arc, like storytelling kind of arc around it. Um, that, uh, I think was done very well again, again, not purposeful, but like, uh, the way at least it was presented was I thought so compelling. Um, well so I'll put it to you this way. Uh, them winning ALGS had nothing to do uh, with a motivator for me to combine forces, right? That's something that, again, isn't really top of my mind. Uh, winning tournaments isn't something that I really care much about. Uh, but I know um, I know there's there's value to it if it's exploited in the right way, right? Which is the storyboard, the arch, the rocky story there of being homeless to winning. That mm -hmm. part is really cool. Um, spending a bunch of money to to acquire some talent to go win a tournament is not something that I'm really interested in. Is, is this a criticism, Deshaun, and this is maybe a bit of a tangent, but you mentioned it in your sort of intro. Um, you, you mentioned, uh, a, at least I sensed a little bit of, of uh, dislike for city-based leagues. Um, uh, which... It just doesn't make much sense to me, you know? <laughs> okay. It, it's, I mean, it's... Um, I'll say that in my mind, the 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 real benefit of of gaming is the fact that it's it's digital, right? It's 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 it. Why on earth would I want to limit myself to a geographic focus? Why not go out there and recruit people from all over the world? I want Europeans and South Americans and Asians. I want all of these people to be fans of my team, and to the extent that I need to um, call it the new jersey x or the los angeles y it limits that potential right that was yep. just my take on things i'm curious do you feel that like what, what do you see in terms of esports teams 
five years from now or 10 years from now from a, you know, big themes perspective? Are we just going to see them, all the existing players continue to grow, increase in size, increase in valuation? Do you see consolidation on the horizon? Like, what what are some of the big themes that you at least think are coming down the pipe for esports teams in general? I, I would expect that esports will stay uh, an important niche in, 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 the, in the world of gaming. Um, so that means that, um, you know, now it's a billion dollar plus minus market. Um, yeah, it'll be 1.5 and then it'll be 2 billion. Um, you know, it's, it's not going to be of sufficient size to justify all the different esports companies that are in the industry right now. Uh, with all the money and all the valuations, it just doesn't it doesn't align uh, in in my mind with what uh, what the overall addressable market is of esports. So that will probably trans uh, that will probably result result in in consolidation and some companies going out of business. Um, you know, I, I'm not the industry is here to stay. I I just don't uh, I don't think there's going to be enough room for all the players that are currently in in, in it right now. So you don't you don't buy the argument. Sorry, Jimmy. I'll, I'll let you jump in. No, no. My question was going to take us a little bit away from here. So why don't you guys? No, I just wanted to sort of often. run this to ground because uh, you know yeah. I've I've spoken so much about this on the podcast, and so it's kind of fun when someone agrees with me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, do you not do you buy the argument? Because I'm a big proponent of gaming is the bigger opportunity here, right? Like I compare it to the iceberg. Esports is what everyone talks about. It's the little piece above the water, yeah. but the real opportunity is everything under the surface. It's the big gaming opportunity. Yeah. Um, do you do you not buy the argument then that there will be esports teams with like traditional sports team size valuations? Like, are we going to get Cloud9 and 100 Thieves at four or five billion dollar valuations? Or do you think there is some cap there and gaming's really the bigger opportunity. Uh, I I don't I don't see esports teams having having anywhere near the traditional sports valuations personally. Um, you know I think I think traditional sports is still it's there's there's a couple of factors to that right. I mean one is there's there's still uh, one of the things that I need to be convinced of is as as games come and go what does that do, right? Um, because I find that still a lot of um, a lot of the power, a lot of the influence comes in from the actual gamers and the streamers themselves, right? So when a big streamer leaves an esports team, I mean, uh, call it the Tifu and FaZe Clan type example, um, their, their audience uh, can crater overnight because um, there, there are a couple of different um, parties that have that have um, that have more power than you'd expect, right? I mean, the fact is, you know, if if um, no matter how big LeBron James is, he still needs to play in the NBA, right? I mean, he's not he can't create his own league. He can't go off and just play uh, play shoot some hoops in the backyard, right? He still needs to be on an NBA team. Um, the fact is, somebody like a, a, a Tifa or a Ninja or a Shroud or any of these people, they're kind of their own entities, right? And they don't really need to be involved in the team. So at some point, when people get big enough, um, one of my concerns in esports is they can they they have enough street cred and, and enough of a following to go off and do their own thing, and that that is something that will always um, limit the potential uh, potential valuations and potential economics associated with esports teams. The other thing that I'm always concerned about is the is the power of publishers, right? Um, Publishers have a whole lot of too much power, one would say. I mean, when you're kind of running the league, um, you dictate the economics, right? And, and in the end, um, those economics can be set forth however a publisher kind of feels like it, right? And I would hate to be beholden to a publisher who just decides that maybe, you know, as soon as you're overly profitable, maybe I'm going to change the license terms, right? And that's something that's always on the table, and I've seen it firsthand, Right. Um, mm -hmm. So that's another factor that isn't really in the world of traditional sports. Um, so there's there's things like that that I think will will restrain um, the upside potential from esports. And I don't think it'll get to a stage where you're going to have, you know, a New York Yankees equivalent or whatever it is in the world of esports. So, Jimmy, sorry, before I let you cut in, I, saw, I just want one quick follow up because I want <laughs> I want to just 
Go I know you it. want to get to something different. So <laughs> you mentioned Shroud and Ninja, Deshaun. Um, quick question. Both of those guys, great gamers, right? And talented gamers in their own right, but now arguably more entertainers and streamers. If Would you consider those guys the right fit for your platform if they wanted to come and create a community or squad around their influence around around themselves? And there's yeah, been rumors no. that both of them have thought about creating esports teams, by the way, yeah. right? At one point or another. Yeah, yeah. No, I think I think that's something that um, that certainly is on the table for us. Um, we're we're giving that a lot of thought uh, because we we do believe that there's there's certainly an opportunity. I mean, these are brands in in and of themselves, right? And the idea of giving somebody, um, you know, giving a, a fan base that numbers in the millions an opportunity to come and be more involved with some of your favorite celebrities, whether they're in the worlds of gaming or whether they're in music, movies, or sports. Um, really, it, um, you know, the fundamentals hold true, right? The idea is here's a new way to really get involved with your celebrities. Um, and, and here's an opportunity for them to go out there and really maximize their value, right? Because it's not just the, the thing about, you know, one of the things I've, I've heard about some of the big gamers and streamers is if they go on vacation for a week, they're, you know, they're, they're kind of, uh, their their network is silent and it impacts revenues. It impacts um, everything that's happening around them. So by having a team around you, I think it does offer a lot of incremental value. So it's certainly something that that we are thinking about how to how to approach guys like that. Sorry, Jimmy. I I really apologize. Go ahead. No, no, it was a great line of questioning, and and I didn't want to take us off of that until the loop was closed. Um, and I kind of wanted to also revisit some of the limitations of teams briefly, uh, not, not apply to Kangarna, but you know, Paul and I had met with a tier one org yesterday, and we learned that they recently walked away from a peripheral sponsorship because some of their top tier players wanted to use other mice or other keyboards and, you know, they're sponsored, there's category exclusivity, they weren't able to. Uh, obviously, when you go the creator route or, or, or whatnot, you know, you have a little bit more flexibility and freedoms there. Uh, I wanted to bring it back to Antares and some of the the teams that you create for your content creators or for you know your traditional entertainment properties. I just wanted to get a sense for your approach towards sponsorships because obviously partnering with some of these people give you access to non-endemic partners. But I was just curious on how you guys approach uh, not just partners in terms of the talent side, but in terms of uh, brand partnerships and, and sponsorships. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, an important topic for us, right? That's the that's the immediate um, revenue model that we're focused on, right? The sponsorships, advertising. There's lots of things that's that are percolating on the content licensing side, and even potentially some NFT uh, work that we're that we're doing. But but yeah, the the sponsorship side is important, and you know the way the way we think about it is there's um, you know that 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 brand alignment needs to be there, right? And quite often the low hanging fruit is many of the celebrities that we work with, they already have uh, uh, sponsorship branding affiliations, right? And so the real, the real, you know, easy pitch is, Hey, um, you know, Nike or Red Bull or Pepsi or whatever it is, um, you're already sponsoring my efforts or, or, ad, or, or, um, you know, what I do, you're, 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 you're already involved in me um, in, in, you know, working with me. And now here's an opportunity to also be involved in, in, in my gaming squad, right? So quite often, um, that's a really easy place to start because there's not a Fortune 500 brand that I've talked to that isn't really spending a lot of time thinking about their gaming future, right? What are they doing in gaming? How, how can they uh, go after this market? They're they know it's they they know it's there they know it's big but they're not really sure how to tackle it right they've they've tried to poke in on the esports world uh, to mixed degrees of uh, of success so so here is a new way for the, them to become involved in the world of gaming right so it has that celebrity alignment which many brands are very comfortable with um, but plus now you have this whole um, content piece and micro influencer piece which adds a lot of value right because you know the thing about the thing about our approach is really the, our, our squads and our teams are really driven by micro influencers and they have tremendous value if you can aggregate them in the right way, right? One, inf one influ micro influencer that's got a thousand followers doesn't move the needle for Coke. But if you put 10,000 of them together and you mobilize them and you kind of steer them in the same direction, all of a sudden you're getting, you know, you're getting ROI, you're getting you know, uh, CPCs that are 10x what you would get with a mega influencer. 
So that's the big advantage that, um, you know, when we're talking to sponsors, um, you know, it's, it's that best of both worlds approach that has that celebrity alignment and it's got that micro influencer piece for performance marketing. You put it together. Um, and I, I don't think there's anyone else that's doing that. Um, so that's, that's really how we fit in there. So, so I spent my entire, I think, first year in esports working nonstop with micro influencers. And I love this topic and I want to spend a little time on it because I know other businesses are starting to see that appeal, like you had mentioned, uh, not just in the engagement, but also in how less expensive these people are, yeah. wider audience, right? Not just local to one region. Um, I have my own personal experiences, but I'm curious what hurdles you guys are coming across when you do approach these micro influencers. You know, they don't have representation. Uh, sometimes they're harder to get a hold of. They're not as prompt uh, on the emails. I'm curious what you're seeing as far as the downsides go. Just for any of our listeners, you know, it's still, I believe, a viable option, but some of the hurdles that they need to expect when approaching this type of community or, or, or or content creator. So, so really, for us, the the, the there's a, there's a lot of hurdles, which is why um, that opportunity hasn't been tapped into as much as well as it could have. But this is where our technology comes into play. This is a real critical piece of it, right? So, our tech is what allows us to automate the process of of vetting these influencers. So, think about the process this way: when we partner with a celebrity, they're, um, the audience that's going to be interested in joining the gaming squad is going to be a subset of their follower base, right? On Twitter and Instagram and, and all the different social, uh, social platforms out there. So you're going to have a bunch of people that are going to, that are interested in joining the squad. Now, how do we figure out who's actually a good fit, right? Who's, who's a, who's a gamer who produces good content, who, who is interested in, who's got authentic interest and engagement in that particular celebrity who's a non-toxic personality you know who are this so, so there's there's a whole subset of people you don't want to work with how do you figure that out in an automated way right and this is where the tech comes into play right so we can vet their social media history pretty quickly um, we have standard contracts that are pretty simple and easy to get through um, so that brings them into our dashboard which they become now parts of the team um, then they're asked to engage in various activities that they're earning points for. Um, so that's the process of, so I would say if you're, if you're trying to, to tackle the micro influencer opportunity manually, you're not gonna, it's not gonna work, right? It just, you can't rely on, on, on email or text or phone call or asking somebody to do something for 20 bucks. It just, it's not gonna scale, right? That's been the issue. We can scale, right? The fact that we can manage 10,000 people as easily as we can manage 10 people, that's the big advantage, right? And if you don't have good tech to allow you to do that, I'd say don't bother. Um, guys, I want to get to some news here. Um, and, uh, you know, we, I know we don't have too much time, but at least I wanted to get to one story that I thought was relevant. And that is FaZe Clan was in the news this week. And the headline here, FaZe Clan partners with DC to create limited edition comic books. So FaZe Clan announced this partnership with DC Comics. They're going to collaborate on a limited edition comic book featuring FaZe Clan content creators uh, who are basically being remade as superheroes. So um, they're going to also sell jerseys, hoodies, mouse pads, of course, because you have to. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the good hoodie org that FaZe <laughs> Clan is. And, uh, and so it's, there's this interesting collaboration, DC Comics, FaZe Clan. I'm curious, Deshaun, let's start with you. What do you think of this? Are you a fan of this kind of collaboration? You think this is going to be a huge success? Your general thoughts on the story. Yeah, I think it's pretty cool, right? I mean, I, I, love, I love these types of crossover events, right? Because, again, back to our vision statement, right? Unifying gaming with pop culture, right? I mean... For us, to the extent that you can infuse gaming and, and not have it be its own specialized niche, but to the extent that you can bring it together with the worlds of blue chip pop culture and, you know, comic books, I would say, arguably are, are, are also a niche in itself. But it's, it's, I think, a step in the right direction, right? Because, um, you know, DC, uh, DC personalities are certainly, you know, very, very much in the mainstream and, uh, to have uh, a mainstream audience exposed uh, into to the world of gaming, I think is a is a pretty cool step. I'm looking forward to seeing more of that uh, in the future. So, so this is a question for both of you, uh, Jimmy. Maybe start with you because I'm curious to get your thoughts on this as well. But um, 
The question for both of you is, who's the bigger winner here? Is it DC Comics or is it FaZe Clan, right? Who, and you know, good partnerships, typically it's it's a win-win, right? It's, it's a win for both sides. Both sides get something out of this, uh, you would hope. But like, who would you say, Jimmy, is the bigger winner here? Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put on my profit uh, hat <laughs> here for a second and be a little bit more animated or opinionated than I typically am. Uh, <laughs> I, I think DC, but I, I think I think DC is the bigger winner here, and I'll say because in my in my personal view, DC has been trash for a while. They've been <laughs> outgunned, outshined by Marvel. The Snyder cut was terrible. I had to watch it through five different sittings. Ten percent slow mo, like that's because it was too slow. You know, I, I just <laughs> I can't stand anything DC's putting out recently, and I feel like Phase said, "Hey, hop on our shoulders. We'll show you the way." will bridge what's really cool and popular right now with your brand that's really losing to Marvel in a big way, in a big public way here. So again, uh, Dushan, I'm sorry to, to give you this opinion of me because I normally am more reserved, but I thought it would be more fun to, to pretend to be the prophet for a few minutes. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, you know I'm what, curious, that's, your thoughts. Who's the that's, bigger winner? That's great. I, I mean, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to disagree. I um, love it. First of all, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to agree with you from the standpoint that, yes, DC movies have been trash relative to Marvel. But despite that, I would still argue, and I could be wrong, but I would argue that DC has a bigger brand than FaZe Clan in the, in the, in the global market, right? Yep. A lot, of people, a lot more people know Batman uh, and Wonder Woman than FaZe Clan would be my guess. True. And as a result of that, I, I think if you're looking at crossover appeal, there's going to be a bunch of Batman and, and uh, Wonder Woman fans who are now saying, what the hell is this phase clan thing about? Let me check into this. Uh, then, then the the reverse. So I would respectfully disagree. Although, yeah, the Snyder cut did suck. So. <laughs> well, thank you. I'll take it. I'll take that as a win. Is, I'm, so another hypothetical question because I love doing these on the podcast. But like, you guys both mentioned Marvel being better than DC currently in terms of the content they're putting out. Um, is there is there an esports team? At a at a big enough level, right, th that you would see a Marvel partnership between them and an esports team. And I know, I think it was TSM. I want to say that did like a special jersey or something that was maybe Marvel inspired or something. Yeah. But it, nothing like this, right? Nothing where they turned their you know uh, their their roster into superheroes or things like that. But is there is there a team, an esports brand, big enough today? to do a Marvel partnership or, or is the argument both of you are making fundamentally that Marvel doesn't need esports brands? It's not about need, right? You know, look at Fortnite bigger, as big as any of these companies that they're partnering with and they do it for fun. So I, I want to pick apart the question just in terms of who's big enough to partner with Marvel. Um, you know, I, I think a lot of it is just which one of these companies, uh, you know, DC, you know, to Dushin's point with a massive brand, which one of these companies values esports in the gaming audience and community enough that they're willing to partner with someone significantly smaller than themselves to organically become part of the gaming conversation. So um, to me, the most natural fit, and this isn't self-serving even a little bit, is X-Men times X-Set, because we both have an X in our names. <laughs> but, uh, but that's obviously just for, for you, to, you to laugh at, Paul. Um, <laughs> no, I, I want to hear Dushin's take also. I'm, I've talked too much. I will I will humbly say that their natural partner is Antares Gaming. There you go. I was hoping <laughs> I was hoping this was <laughs> and, and and the reason why I'll say that is because um I think Marvel is is too big for any esports organization, but they're not too big for gaming, right? Yep. Gaming is massive and what Marvel should be doing is going out there and taking all of that brand and reputation that they have. And now, now thinking to themselves, how do we leverage um, our power across the world of gaming? How do we enter into the world of gaming? And how do we create a team that aligns with what we care about, that invites fans to come and join and, and participate in cool exclusive events and have an opportunity to go out there and play with um, Black Widow or, uh, you know, or, or Iron Man? Um, you know, how do we leverage those opportunities? How do we invite uh, all the different, uh, you know, big, big movie stars uh, with all the different branding, you know, how do we really take advantage of what we have as, as Marvel and how do we build uh, a perpetual motion um, gaming community that just continues to run with, with what we're doing. Right. 
I mean, I couldn't have asked for a better answer to end the podcast on um, and a better thought. Uh, look, I love seeing uh, any traditional media, uh, gaming seeping into any traditional media and traditional media seeking out gaming, right? The, both of those scenarios, however you want to slice this, I think is just massively positive for the industry. Um, Deshaun, how, how can people find you if you want to be found? I know you mentioned the website, Antares Gaming, but um, what is the best way for people to reach you or follow you or find you uh, should you want to be? Yeah, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm out there a little bit. Yeah. Um, so so you'll, you'll find me on uh, LinkedIn under my name. Um, and otherwise, we do have our Twitter, Instagram website uh, on the Antares Gaming side. Uh, I don't do anything personal on the on the Twitter and Instagram stuff. I guess I'm I'm too old for that or something. I don't know, but uh, but yeah, just hit the website or or LinkedIn and uh, you'll find me there and reach out anytime. Always happy to chat. Yeah, and if, if anyone from Marvel is listening, um, <laughs> go check out Antares Gaming and maybe yeah. reach. Out. That's right. Um, Deshaun, thank you so much for being on the podcast. We really appreciate it. Uh, Jimmy, thank you as always. Uh, for those guys, for all of you who are listening, uh, just a quick reminder, every Wednesday evening, 8.30 p.m. Eastern Time, we do a live stream. Um, it's We cover all the news that didn't make it into the podcast, which is a lot of the news. It's a bigger cast. It's a lot of fun. But the best part is we get to do it live with you guys. And so you get to interact and ask us questions and get in our faces and disagree with the prophet, even though you'll be wrong. But uh, you get to do it anyways. And uh, it's a lot of fun. So I highly recommend uh, the live stream, 8.30 p.m. Eastern Time every Wednesday. If you love the podcast, you're going to love it. And by the way, we upload the live stream episodes to the podcast feed. So if you listen to the podcast, you can also listen to those live streams after the fact. They're still just as much fun. Um, and a second quick reminder, go check out businessofesports.shop. Guys, get yourself some Business of Esports merch. I know uh, at the conference Jimmy and I were at, there were a lot of people uh, who bought uh, Gamers Against Aim Assist shirts, uh, which uh, fitting for this episode because we mentioned Apex Legends. Apex was sort of the, the, the reason for that shirt uh, to come into being. Uh, Jimmy, you were going to say something <laughs> before I wrap up here? Yeah, you know, I just was going to say because you were talking about the live show. Before I was ever on the show, you know, I used to skip the live show because I didn't realize what it was. And for those of you that have been longtime listeners that always love Paul's insights on these stories and headlines, like what we just covered with Dushin at the end with Baze and Marvel, that's where we do so much of that. It really is coming. It's, it's, it's taking on its own life. It's its own show for us. If you, if you want to stay current on trends and events, um, you know, don't, don't, don't skip it. Don't miss it. We have a lot of fun. And again, you don't have to listen live, but we love having the interactivity. So, so make it if you can. Cool. Um, I love it. And we'll see you guys, uh, there hopefully um this podcast uh, as always you'll you'll catch it every week we appreciate all of you guys make sure to leave those five star ratings and reviews follow us everywhere instagram tiktok twitter youtube everywhere you find our content we appreciate all of you thank you so much and we'll see you next week thanks a lot guys <laughs>